uh, Mr. Rickards, thank you for so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's so it's it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Blake. Great to be with you. And I, you know, I, I'm I'm like I said, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to grab a glass of water, and I'm going to I'm going to watch uh, your interview. I, I'm excited to have Justine here. Uh, she's she's obviously a pro, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to leave you two at it. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much, Blake. Thank you. Jim, I want to give you a, a real introduction. I want to say, you know, you are the editor of the financial newsletter, Strategic Intelligence, and he's the New York Times bestselling author of the books, including The Great, the New Great Depression and Currency Wars, which I do say I, I recently broke into it. Oh, I don't know if my, my screen will show it, but I have it here, oh, here in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did break into this recently, um, and there's a lot of great nuggets um, relating to the current macro environment, even though this was written over a decade ago. So I do want to get into some of that, um, but Jim, it's it's great to have you here. Thank you, Justine, great to be with you. Yeah. Um, part of your bio that I didn't talk about was the fact that um, you've also been an advisor on capital markets to the US intelligence community. And you know, given that uh, the war um, between Russia and Ukraine is on everyone's minds, and I do want to focus on the um, economic aspect of that. Um, I'm curious as to how effective or ineffective you see uh, US strategy with Russia in terms of economics. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'll give you the short answer and then an expanded answer. The short answer is uh, um, almost completely in, ineffective, but actually worse than ineffective, I would say it's going to boomerang on the United States. And there's a there's an old story in the, from the 1950s that uh, President Eisenhower was being urged to use tactical nuclear weapons in a in, in the Korean War, and uh, he uh, he wisely did not do that. Chose not to do that. But uh, one of the questions he asked the military advisors was, uh, "What if they don't work?" And uh, what he meant by that, he was he didn't mean that they wouldn't detonate. He thought they would. He said, what if we do it and the Chinese still keep coming? In other words, they don't have, they're not as horrible as they sound. They're not as scary as, uh, as people thought. And we're actually showing them that they don't work. And I think that is exactly the situation with US economic sanctions on Russia today. We've thrown everything we have at them. These are the most severe, you know, the Treasury has said this and the White House has said this, and they're right. These are the most severe, most extreme, most comprehensive economic sanctions ever imposed. And there's nothing new about um, you know, the economy and warfare, kinetic warfare, sort of combining in certain ways. Uh, people forget six months before Pearl Harbor, uh, in August of 1941, uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, put economic sanctions on Japan. He froze their bank accounts and imposed an oil embargo in Japan. Sound familiar? Uh, and six months later, they bombed Pearl Harbor. So, uh, so there are unintended consequences, unforeseen effects, but again, nothing new about the economics of warfare. But this is uh, different in a couple of respects. Number one, these sanctions are, as I say, broader, more comprehensive than ever. Uh, and they're actually bigger than the war. More, more people are going to die because of these sanctions than are being killed in Ukraine. As tragic and uh, as difficult as that is, um, people are going to die of starvation. I'll give you a very concrete example. Russia and Ukraine together account for about 25% of the world's grain exports. Now, uh, uh, sorry, wheat exports in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not all the wheat grown in the world because most of the wheat grown in the world is consumed in the countries that grow it. But there's a large, huge export market and they're 25% of that market. But you go around particular countries in the region, in the Middle East and Africa, and some of those countries get 100% of their wheat from Ukraine, for example, and Lebanon is an example, Sudan, other countries in Africa. Well, right now, there's no wheat coming out of Russia because uh, of the sanctions, and there's no wheat coming out of Ukraine because of the war. The Russians are systematically uh, occupying or seizing the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. They'll get around to probably a combined airborne amphibious assault on Odessa you know, in late April, early May. So there's no grain coming out of Ukraine. Well, that means they're going to starve in Lebanon. They're going to starve in Sudan. And, and you know, this will be a humanitarian tragedy of uh, almost incomprehensible magnitude. More people will die because of that. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of other uh, supply chain effects uh, that, that we can talk about. But uh, U.S. citizens are going to end up paying a much higher price than Russian citizens. And Russian citizens are paying a price. There's no question about it. 
But you have to ask yourself, other than kind of a feel-good aspect, what are the sanctions designed to do? Well, punish Russia. Okay, well, that's, that's punishing, punishing the Russian people. I'm not sure you're punishing Vladimir Putin or the, uh, or the Russian general staff. But it has not changed the behavior on the battlefield one bit. The war hasn't stopped. There's no ceasefire. There's no uh, armistice. The negotiations are on and off, but they're really not going anywhere. Russia continues to roll up its targets in Mariupol, and um, they've got Kershaw, uh, they've surrounded Kharkiv, uh, Kharkiv. They're creating what's called a cauldron, basically surrounding Ukrainian troops in the east. They're eliminating the um, kind of Nazi-like elements, the Azov brigades and, and others. Um, this idea that you know Putin was going to be a three-day blitzkrieg, take Kiev, that was Western propaganda designed to create a situation where if Putin didn't do it, he looked like a failure. Who says he was ever going to do that? that? That wasn't part of the Russian battle plan. I don't have the Russian battle plans in front of me, by the way, but you can see what they're doing. If you, and it's very hard to get good information. Most of what's coming out of the West is uh, either outright lies or you know, thinly veiled propaganda. But Russia's doing what they set out to do. They're, they're securing the the east and the south, the Donbass region, Luhansk, Donetsk, um, Crimea was never, they had it already. Uh, and they're expanding control of the Dnieper River. So, uh, so, you know, getting back to the sanctions, the sanctions haven't accomplished one thing in terms of changing the, uh, shaping the battle on the ground and in the air, but they have decimated supply chains and uh, will possibly create a global recession later this year. So <laughs> extremely costly. Uh, ineffective in the sense that they don't change behavior on the battlefield. And worst of all, uh, it's sort of, you know, if you're Russia, and it's not just Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, um, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, Dubai, they're all looking at this and saying, huh, is, is this all you got? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, because it's hard to know what, what more we could do. Um, we've frozen accounts, kicked them out of SWIFT, uh, kicked them out of the payment system, um, stopped you know, exports of energy, you know, at least on a forward basis, uh, frozen their accounts, uh, made it possible for them to pay bondholders, et cetera. By the way, what happens when you tell Russia they can't pay their bondholders? They've got about $50 billion of dollar denominated uh, government debt. It's not a lot relative to their GDP, but that's a big number. Uh, and a lot of dollar denominated corporate debt. When you tell the debtor they can't pay, who gets hurt? It's not the debtor, it's the creditor. So the, you have to ask yourself, well, who owns the Russian bonds? The answer is BlackRock has a lot, uh, but you might have them in your 401k. Did, you know, did, did anyone buy uh, an, uh, you know, a developing economy, emerging market CTF from Morgan Stanley? I don't mean to pick on Morgan Stanley, it's a good firm, but you know, look, at the, look at the offering document, get, get the account statement, look at the fine print, probably some Russian bonds in there somewhere. So the, the cost, is borne by the bondholders, by the creditors, which are U.S. citizens and U.S. Uh, um, uh, funds, uh, investment funds, and wealth managers, et cetera. Not by the, the the debtor; they get to you know skip the payment and save the money. So, um, lots of unintended effects, lots of boomerang effects, where we we actually lose uh, and no impact on the battlefield. So, I would call that an across the board failure. You bring up a lot of points that I kind of want to touch on. One was the supply chain issues and grain, um, because it's not just grain, but grain feeds livestock. And so that means meat prices and all sorts of things um, are also affected. So there's, it's not just uh, one thing, but there's a huge trickle down effect right. from that. Um, but I'm also curious, you know, if you look at SWIFT, uh, two major banks, there are so many exceptions from uh, the SWIFT ban. Um, if you look at the sanctions, you could also argue, well, they're not really sanctioning um, a lot of oil and gas. And so, um, and there's, there's the exemptions uh, are there and things are being phased in. So um, would you say that the sanctions and I guess some of these measures aren't effective because they haven't really been put into play yet? Well, first of all, very good question, Justine. And, and you're exactly right. So today was the latest joke. So the European Union announced today that they're banning um, exports of coal from Russia to, uh, to the European Union. So the European Union is not going to buy any more coal from Russia. But I'm enough of a geek that I actually read the fine print. I said those, that coal ban is effective in August. Not today, August. So they're kind of, no, it's just not in effect today. They announced it with a great fanfare, but it's not in effect. 
It's going to be in effect in August. And they're kind of betting, well, maybe the war will be over by August and we can keep buying the coal. So it it sounds uh, harsh. It makes headlines. Like, oh, that's it for coal from Russia. But not really. They're still selling the coal and they will through August. We'll see what happens in August. But it's worse than that. Um, the natural gas is still flowing from Russia to West Germany. West Germany gets 46% of their natural gas from Russia. And, you know, former Chancellor Merkel spent 14 years shutting down coal fire plants, shutting down uh, nuclear plants, um, disabling, shutting down to the extent possible natural gas plants, building windmills and, and uh, solar modules, you know, alternative energy, et cetera. Um, I, uh, I've got nothing against that. I, I happen to own one of the, uh, actually the largest non-commercial solar field in New England. So I know a lot about it. I build it. And uh, here's what I know. It doesn't work at night and it doesn't work in the snow and it doesn't work in the rain. Um, now, you don't run your house or factory or city or anything else from solar modules. You run it off of batteries and the batteries are charged by the electricity from the solar uh uh, module so the batteries kind of intermediate that so what i really watch are the batteries on rainy days but um the point being uh that stuff's not scalable i don't care what the green news scam people or the climate alarmists say it's not scalable uh it has its place you cannot run a modern power grid on that stuff because on that on those kinds of alternatives because they're intermittent like i say wind turbines don't turn when the wind doesn't blow solar doesn't work at night it feeds batteries, but you can't maintain what's called the base load in the power grid. You need oil, natural gas, or uranium. Uh, so that's what Germany got away from. So they're utterly dependent on the Russian natural gas. Well, the Russian natural gas is coming through. Guess where the pipelines are? Ukraine. They run through Ukraine. The Russians are paying Ukrainians $2 billion a year in transit fees to move the natural gas. So here you have Russia's invaded Ukraine. You have a human tragedy. You have a war, you have full-scale war. And yet one combatant's paying the other one $2 billion a year in transit fees, and the gas has not been interrupted. So there's been almost no disruption in oil, natural gas, or coal, despite these announcements and despite these threats, because there cannot be. You want to shut down the fourth largest economy in the world? You want to shut down German manufacturing? You want to shut down German exports? Well, cutting off the energy is a good way to do that, because they're going to have to ration it and allocate the natural gas so people can you know, keep the lights on. So I guess, again, there's so much, to the extent that things are happening, they're very detrimental to the United States and Western Europe. But there's a lot less happening than meets the eye because this is mostly for show. Would you say that the US, well, would you say that Europe needs Russia's gas as much as Russia needs Europe to keep paying for its gas? Well, Russia's not gonna sell gas unless they get paid, so we can start there. Yeah. But um, Europe is more dependent on Russian natural gas than Russia is on uh, Europe's business. That's that's mm -hmm. a fact, because there's a global shortage of energy. That, I mean, and by the way, Justine, we're we're talking about specific um, supply chain disruptions and and what's called cost push inflation uh, and other uh, consequences of the economic sanctions. That's a huge topic, but these supply chain disruptions uh, didn't start with the war. They didn't even start with the pandemic. They started with Trump's trade war beginning in 2018. Um, and there's, there's, I found a very good book on that uh, written by um, uh, Lorianne LaRocco. Uh, and what's interesting about her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did, and the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one? And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of uh, tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. So that, that's, that, that was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it um, uh, even worse than that. But uh, we, you know, we, we talked about... Uh, some of the impacts and uh, yeah, I mean, energy prices have gone up and they're gonna go up more. Um, the, and partly because these uh, sanctions, because of the delayed effective dates, well, they've already had an impact just by announcing them. What happens when they actually kick in? People have, have lived off of what's called um, safety stock or you know, excess inventories and you know, any intermediary or distributor hates inventories because it ties up 
working capital, but you have to have some. And they've been able to draw down on that to cushion a little bit, but now that's running out. They're going to have to go back to the market and find that uh, fertilizer prices have tripled, oil prices are you know they've doubled uh, in a fairly short period of time. Uh, aluminum, palladium, platinum, nickel. Everyone loves EVs. So okay, EVs have batteries. How do you make batteries? You know, lithium and nickel. Um, and and you know, Tesla shut down their their plant in uh, Shanghai, and that's not even getting into the continuing effects of COVID. Now, China has this stupid policy they call it zero COVID. You, you might as well say zero colds. You know, no one can get a cold. I mean, the Omicron variant of COVID is not much worse than a cold. It's a mild flu in most cases. It's, you know, it can be fatal in some cases, but very, very few. Uh, so shutting down the world's second largest economy, the world's largest population over a cold, that's what they're doing. Shanghai is shut down. I mean, when I say shut down, you can't go outside. Um, you can't get into the city without a PCR test, shutting down flights. Uh, Ningbo, which is the port adjacent to Shanghai, the largest container cargo port in the world, is uh, very badly affected by this. Um, and there are 26 million people in Shanghai. This is three, three times the size of New York or more. So that's, uh, I mean, that's going on, again, in, on top of the war sanctions. So we're, we're pretty much... Uh, uh, trashing our supply chains and guaranteeing inflation. We do have a question from the audience that I want to bring up, which is, um, what do you think the actions of the U.S. West against Russia should have been um, without, obviously, any sort of direct um, boots on the ground? Right. Um, well, uh, cyber warfare is a good friend. Now, it's a two-way street. The Russians are pretty good at it, but that's something uh, you know one might have done. Uh, the well, I mean, I'll give you the answer. The, this is a war that never should have happened. I've never seen a war that was easier to prevent and easier to end. It could end in 48 hours or less. All you have to do is uh, Zelensky, who and this stuff about Zelensky is the new Churchill. I mean, it's nonsense. He's a kind of a talented propagandist, and but he's an oligarch and and a, and a corrupt one at that. Um, but all Zelensky has to do is say Ukraine will not join NATO. Uh, and Ukraine will remain neutral uh, and will give autonomy, uh, maybe more to uh, Luhansk and Donetsk and have that backed up by the United States and Russia and they can sign a treaty of some sort. Now, if you had done that uh, in, let's say, last fall, December, maybe the latest, or even January, um, the war would have been prevented. If you do it now, which they're going to end up doing, because that's the only way this ends, uh, the war would be over. Uh, but you could have skipped the war. I mean, this is what an idiot Zelensky is, because he, he he's going to end up in the same place. Putin's going to put him in the same place. But he could have done it in advance and skipped the war. His mistake was he trusted Biden. Um, that's a bad bet. I just talk to the people in Afghanistan. If you can uh, count on Biden, the answer is no. He'll leave you to uh, to your enemies. So, um, so I guess my answer is... Uh, I've already pointed out how these economic sanctions are ineffective. My answer is, if we didn't have real lightweights like Tony Blinken in the State Department and Jake Sullivan of the National Security Council uh, and others who are really incompetent, we easily could have prevented the war. So that was a failure of American uh, diplomacy, a great failure. And we can still end the war, but you got to do what I just said. Interesting. I want to bring up a quote from um, Currency Wars, which is you, you talk actually at length about Russia and Ukraine and gas and yeah. how that impacts Europe. Um, and you say that Russia's cutoffs of natural gas are devastating at the best of times. Uh, the next gas cutoff could have a catastrophic impact and that victims of blue fuel warfare do have a remedy. They can turn their backs on NATO, the euro, the dollar and the West. Uh, do you see, how do you see politics in Europe changing? It seems that um, there's been a big rally around NATO um, and now more countries are actually considered joining NATO. Do you, do you see more global divisions um, between basically the rest, West and the East? Uh, yeah, two, two part question uh, that, yeah, definitely divisions. Uh, we're, we're breaking up not only is there not a global U.S. hegemony, I'm not sure there ever was, but um, the U.S. has kind of really ceded uh, its position as uh, an influence in the world through, through bad policy. Um, 
but yeah, China's taking notes, Russia's taking notes. So I think you'll see a US slash Western Europe, Australian, uh, Canadian block, uh, you know, toward Japan in there. Um, you'll see a Chinese block. China doesn't have too many friends, but they're a big country and they'll bring some people along with them. Um, and a, a Russian block. Um, I mean, the great tragedy here, this goes back to 2014, when Obama, the CIA, and MI6 ran uh, basically a coup d'etat in uh, Ukraine. They chased out a duly elected president. Now, the president was um, uh, uh, pro-Russian, but he was elected. I mean, they actually had a democracy, and, and he won the election, and, uh, and that wasn't good enough. So the CIA and MI6 ginned up this revolution with some uh, nationalist, extreme nationalist forces that we had trained and armed, and they had snipers in Maidan, you know, shooting people, and the president fled, he's in Russia, and then we put a puppet in uh, and, and went from there. So that was really the root. I mean, you can go all the way back to, uh, I don't know, George H.W. Bush and uh, you know, 1989 and the Bucharest Dec Declaration in 2008. There's a long series of blunders of insisting that Ukraine should join NATO, which was never going to be part of NATO. I mean, it's, it's a buffer state. They have to be neutral. Um, but, uh, but we did it anyway. Uh, and, you know, Biden is non compass mentis, but he has lucid moments. So every now and then he'll say something that's actually correct. Uh, because he, his sanity kind of his cognition returns briefly. And when he said, um, you know, Putin cannot remain in charge, I forget his exact words, but words to that effect, it basically that regime change was the policy of the United States. It is the policy of the United States. Well, okay, how do you expect Putin to react to that? I mean, he was elected. I know they, uh, they uh, suppress free speech and lock up their political enemies. It's not, uh, uh, you know, Athenian uh, democracy from the fifth uh, century BC, but, um, but he was elected, and so the United States is supposed to tell Russia to get rid of him. You start messing around with regime change in a country with 8,000 nuclear weapons, uh, that's crazy. Uh, but that's, uh, we have a generation of leaders who are scarcely leaders. They're basically incompetent. They, were, they, they, go, they went to the right schools. They have all the credentials, but they didn't learn much. Uh, but yeah, the ones, the ones I mentioned. Um, and... Uh, They've been on this case since the 1990s, and they were uh, world products of our, you know, kind of upbringing or academic training in some respects. And what was going on in the 90s? Well, in the 1990s, it was after the Berlin Wall fell. It was after the fall of the Soviet Union. The U. The sorry, Russia under Yeltsin, who was a you know, serious alcoholic, seemed to be on some kind of path to something. You know, just like us is the is the phrase that um, you know these uh, all these uh, lightweights use. And um, they, there was even some talk at the time that Russia would join NATO because they were going to be this, you know, democracy. And I was, I was actually recruited at the time to help build them, you know, the modern version of the Moscow Stock Exchange. Um, but it was all an illusion. They were never going to be like us. And uh, Putin kind of restored uh, nationalism and, you know, gave them more pride and got Russia back on track and they got through the 98 crisis and and all that but the people in charge today were kind of 40 early 40s they were in their 20s or uh, you know college age let's say in the 1990s and they grew up on this idea that putin betrayed the democratic promise of russia so they've hated putin ever since i mean they hate trump and they hate putin well you know trump was president and putin's still president that's the other thing you know, all these people say putin's on the wrong side of history well first of all history doesn't have sides but beyond that uh, they're all gone. They're on the golf course, you know, Obama and Trump and Bush and Bush's painting and all that. And Putin's still in charge. So tell me who's on the wrong side. So um, I, I guess uh, NATO is hollow. Um, you know, the German army, I think they're probably more hairdressers in the German army than uh, pilots. Um, a lot of these, you know, the, the Dutch fight, they have, they have a pretty good military, the, the Brits fight. Uh, but um uh, they're uh they don't spend enough they don't have the um enough equipment enough ammunition to fight a major war and, and they don't want one i mean germany just wants to turn on the gas and Nord Stream too and get back to business and so everyone's paying lip service to biden who's uh mia as a leader and uh, so i don't put much stock in nato but to your other point yeah the world is breaking up uh, we're decoupling where globalization is over There'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see 
you know, maybe the, the five eyes, um, uh, you know, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and friends in Western Europe form uh, a new trading block, but exclude China and Russia. It'll be a little bit more like the Cold War. Interesting. Now, actually, uh, you know, turning back to the economy, you would we talked briefly about uh, the potential for a Russian default. Um, you have firsthand knowledge. Um, you were the in 1988. You were the principal negotiator for the rescue of long-term capital management, um, yeah. which was sponsored by the Federal Reserve, and that was partly due to um, Russia defaulting on its its debt. Um, does, from your perspective, does the government? Um, want to avoid having to, you know, bail out entities, bail out pension funds, all sorts of things. How do you see the U.S. negotiating, um, I guess, supporting its own economy and um, versus the potential for a Russian default? Well, they're first of all, they're closely linked. Um, they, the government doesn't want to bail out anybody, but since they don't know what they're doing, they, they end up bailing out people. Um, no one's less prepared for this than Janet Yellen. I mean, she's basically a labor economist, statistics geek. She doesn't really understand what we're, what we're talking about. But what happened in 1998 is uh, everyone's like, oh, long-term capital lost all this money in Russia. That's not true. We lost hundred million in Russia, but we lost 4 billion overall. Russia was a catalyst that caused a global financial crisis that spun out of control that caused the losses. And we, we had 106 different positions. So, you know, your, uh, your long uh, a, a synthetic basket of French equities and short French equity futures on the Matif, that was the old futures exchange, not around anymore. And your long JDBs and your short JGB futures on uh, um, COMEX or whatever the exchange might be. And, you know, 106 position, and you're like, well, yeah, some of them are going to make money, some of them are going to lose money, but how could they all lose money at the same time? How is that even possible? Well, the answer is that uh, in a normal uh, degree distribution, normal markets, even kind of edgy markets, they, they're not correlated, but there's something called conditional correlation, which is something extreme happens and everything correlates at once. They all go down together. And that's what happened. So Russia was the catalyst for that. August 17th, 1998, they devalued the ruble and defaulted on their debt. Uh, and I mean, the, the company that lost the most money was actually Credit Suisse, but it didn't matter what your Russian losses were. What that did is that started a global financial crisis. The best description of which I've ever heard is everybody wants their money back. It doesn't matter what the trade is, what the spread is, what the arbitrage is, everybody wants their money back. And so everyone's deleveraging and getting out of their balance sheet so that all the spreads are widening, all the positions are losing money. Um, and then it ended up in our lap. When we called the Fed uh, in kind of mid-September, we didn't think we were going to get bailed out. We weren't asking for a bailout. Uh, we knew what was going on. We just called them like good corporate citizens. We're like, hey, we want you to know what's going on. We see it to like two decimal places. This is a disaster. It's going to get a lot worse. We thought you ought to know. Uh, but we weren't, we didn't ask for anything. We didn't expect it. But when they came up, uh, Peter Fisher and uh, actually Gary Gensler, who's now the head of the SEC, came up, we spent a day going through the books. Their faces were white. I mean, they were just like pale. Uh, like we knew you guys would take down the bond market, but we didn't know that you would close every stock market in the world because we, we had $15 billion of risk guard positions on. Um, and so that's when the bailout talks began and, and we got through that. So we brought it in for soft landing, but you know, if you're younger than like 40, you've never heard of it. And if you're younger than 60, you might, maybe you recall it a little bit, but not really. But that's what happened. The thing, the thing is the same thing is happening again. Russia is being forced into a default. Now, ever since 1998, Russia spent all their time and effort building up the reserves. And very successfully, they have $600 billion in reserves of which about $150 billion or 20% is in gold bullion. Uh, and now, you know, the rest in, uh, you know, government securities and, and other liquid instruments, some you want actually in, in there. Um, so they can pay their bills with ease, but they're not being allowed to. This is a default where the creditors force them into default. How does that, when does that happen? You know, the debtor goes into default, that happens. But when does the creditor say, you can't pay me? Um, that's what we did. So what was the first big blow up as a result of um, prospective Russian default? Um it wasn't in Russia. It wasn't in the United States. It was the nickel king of China. There was a guy in China with a major nickel mine who was short like $8 billion of, of nickel futures. And the price of nickel went up by a factor of five. And he lost, uh, forget the exact number, like $7 billion 
um, on, on, sh on a short nickel position when the price of nickel went up by, by five times. So this, the point is, this shows you it, it, is a, um, it is a complex system. It is densely connected. You can predict a catastrophe, but you don't know exactly where and when. So here, Russia and the U.S. are fighting an economic war, but the guy in China loses, you know, as I say, seven billion. Um, that's how these things roll. The Treasury doesn't understand it. I, I warned them about it for a long time. They don't listen. Uh, the Fed doesn't understand it, uh, but it happens. And and so I wouldn't um, rule out the fact that we're playing with fire here, and that a, a global financial crisis could emerge. Yeah, everything is, I mean, as we've learned time and time again, everything is so intimately interconnected. Um, and there's all sorts of links that people don't necessarily realize. And there's so many knock on effects. Um, I do want to get to some things that are macro events that are happening in the US, especially um, inflation, which is a big thing that's been on everyone's mind, especially with Fed um, and plans to raise rates. Um, I'm curious as to how you see the current uh, inflation environment right now. I know last year you talked about that, that we reached peak inflation um, and yet you know here we are with inflation right. still growing. What do you think has changed and where do you see inflation going? Well, inflation from here is going to get worse and then we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, yeah, the, the 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021, because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst recession since 1946. Um, but the base effects would run off uh, in September, or October, November. So, but the inflation persisted, um, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation is coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain. Uh, this is um, demand pull inflation, which is what I expected to cool off, which never really got very strong to begin with. That's when the consumer, that's when the individual says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of buying a TV set. I better buy it today. Drop everything and buy that TV set because the price is going to go up a month from now or two months from now. Might as well get it now before the price goes up. That's demand pull. We're not in that state yet. We're getting dangerously close, but we're not there yet. That's a psychological phenomenon, nothing to do with the Fed. Now, the inflation is coming from the supply side, from uh, what's called cost push inflation, which the Fed can't do anything about either um, because the Fed doesn't drill for oil, they don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. Um, and that's where um, the war and the sanctions uh, and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I say you can, uh, you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. And the, the data is clear, the inflation is here. It's gonna persist. The supply chains are getting worse. You know, the things we, we just talked about, uh, and in some ways, as I said, because the impact of the sanctions has been delayed and because certain intermediate you know, distri distributors and manufacturers have some safety, uh, safety stock, as they call it, which is um, uh, inventory, which is runoff, uh, the full impact of these supply chain disruptions hasn't even hit yet. And you, you mentioned, Justine, you were right. Um, you know, wheat's not just the price of bread, it's the price of beef because the cows eat the wheat or corn or whatever it may be. They eat the grain and... That's where we get the meat. Yes, if it's worse than that, because how do you get it from the slaughterhouse to the supermarket? You need a truck. Well, truck's paying for diesel gas, and that goes into the transportation costs, which goes into the final price. So this is going to get a lot worse. Now, the question is, what's the Fed going to do about it? Um, they're going to, well, they are raising interest rates. Okay, they raised them a quarter point in March. They're going to raise them 50 basis points in May. Uh, they're going to bring back, uh, everyone's like, the Fed's printing money. No, they're not. They stopped printing money two months ago, and now they're going to start burning money. They're going to go into quantitative tightening, actually reducing the money supply, reducing the balance sheet. Probably, you know, 80, well, they'll probably announce caps of 95 billion a month, but the actual will be close to 80 billion a month because you can't dump the mortgage-backed securities as easily. But, but that's, a, that's still a big number. That's still a trillion dollars a year. Um, so we've got triple tightening, which is, rate hikes higher than one expected even a, a couple of months ago, plus QT at a very high level. But it's too late um, because real rates are dropping. 
So what's the real rate? Well, real rate is just nominal rate minus inflation, right? So if you get, if you get, let's just say they do 50 basis points in May and 50 basis points in June, and you get the, what's called the policy rate up to one and a quarter, which is where it would be. All right. But inflation, if inflation is 8% and your policy rate is uh, one and a quarter, your real rate is uh, negative 6.75. Uh, it, it's it's six and three quarters negative. In other words, um, they're not raising rates fast enough to keep up with the inflation. So the higher the inflation goes in a, in a world where they're not raising rates very quickly, real rates are more negative, which not only doesn't stop inflation, that feeds inflation. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, where would, where would interest rates have to be to get a neutral policy rate that's kind of two two and a half percent would be the poly, the, the neutral rate so how do you get to a real rate of positive two and a half percent in a world of eight percent inflation well the answer is uh ten and a half interest rates would have to be ten and a half percent to get to real rates of, of positive 2.5 who thinks uh that the fed can get rates to Ten and a half percent without causing the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, I don't see a lot of hands out there. I, mean, I can't see the audience, but uh, nobody thinks that um, the Fed will not be able to get interest rates to five percent without causing a recession. Not to, not to mention the impact on the deficit and a lot of other things. So the Fed can't escape the room. And by the way, um, so if, so if inflation stays where it is, the Fed can't get interest rates to a real level. Uh, without causing a recession, which will sink the stock market. Um, but if even if inflation comes down a little bit, that'll be a sign of recession. So you're raising rates into a recession, which will cause a recession. You end up in a recession either way. Um, it's just a question of whether the Fed persists or throws in the towel. Now, we've seen this movie before. What's going on is an exact replay of what happened between 2013 and 2019. Now, just quickly... May 2013, Bernanke announces the taper. Expectations are going to start the taper in September. He chickens out. They start the taper in November 2014. They finish 13, rather. They finish the taper in November 2014. Then here comes Yellen. and she's going to raise rates. We're going to take out the word patient from the from the statement. She doesn't raise rates until December 2015. And then she doesn't raise them again until December 2016. They went a whole year between two 25 basis point rate cuts. And then here comes Powell and then boom, okay, 25 basis points, boom, 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 gets them up to two and a quarter, which is where they want it to be and gets the balance sheet down to about three and a half trillion. They want to get it down to about two and a half trillion. But he's, he's got rates about where he wants them. He's got the balance sheet on its way down uh, and uh, he's normalizing. And what happens? The stock market crashes 20% between October 1st 2018 and December 24, 2018. That was the famous Christmas Eve massacre where the stock market fell 3% in one day. Okay. But the Fed still tightened. The Fed tightened um, like a week before the Christmas Eve massacre. They tightened into the weakness. They 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 were they were getting very close to crashing the stock market. They took it down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing it. So what happens next? First week of January, Powell comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. You have to get your code book out, but we're, we're going to be patient. Um, then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it's eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE eight, let's say. Um, and then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic and rates go down to zero. And the balance sheet goes to $7 trillion. They were back where they were in May of 2013 except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. Uh, one of two things is going to happen, and it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening and try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market. Or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip, which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. 
Where, where do you see, I mean, it's funny, I'm curious if you see any other historical parallels here, because um, I keep thinking back to the, the 1970s with the oil embargo, and, and you know, that was a summer place where we did have inflation, the Fed was forced to, to raise rates, and it's interesting because uh, Lael Brainerd, who is a noted dove, um, actually invoked uh, quotes from Paul Volcker um, in her most recent speech. And so she was talking about the need to get ahead of inflation. It seems that uh, the Fed's somewhat behind on that train right now. Um, but I'm curious, is there um, similarities between what the Fed needs to do now versus what happened in the 1970s with Volcker? Uh, yeah, and I, I talked to Paul Bulk about this, but they, uh, but here's what happened in the 70s. Now, it, and you're exactly right, Justine, it started as cost push inflation. It was the Arab oil embargo in 1973 after the, uh, after the 1973 uh, war, uh, the Israel-Arab war, uh, then the Arabs threw the embargo on us. The price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but that's a 300% increase. Um, and then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time that was the worst um, recession since the Great Depression. Then uh, uh, we come out of that, and along comes the Fed, you know, and um, uh, you know the, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in '72. It was a little earlier for his reelection effort, et cetera. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then you had another uh, Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were, there were double oil shocks. That was uh, supply-driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it, it morphed into um, a demand-driven inflation where, and I, I lived through it. I mean, I was, you know, I was a, a young up and coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where you, if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So, so that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. Uh, it shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows that it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull, uh, morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. Again, we're, we got the first thing. We're not quite there with the second thing yet, but we probably will, partly because the Fed is so far behind the curve. So, And, and Vol Volcker crushed it. Volcker crushed it. But um, at a huge cost, unemployment was uh, about 11%. He took interest rates to 20%. How does that feel? Uh, you know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20%. You're talking about 40% on credit cards in that world. Um, and, and people forget, you know, that, you know, well, it doesn't inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least, or low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980, and 1981, which lasted until 1982. So um, the whole era was, was marked by, and by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. That's why gold went to $800 an ounce from 35 to 2,700% uh, to increase. Uh, and in the, in the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The US treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now, it was treasury debt. You had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. Wow. We're getting back to something like that. Now, you know, given that scenario, and then we're running out of time, I do want to thank you for that. So for the final question, where are you looking to invest in this environment? You know, are you looking at miners, uh, gold, uh, commodities, equities, or stay out of equities? What do you... Um, advice for people to do. Yeah, by the way, I should, probably should have said sooner, but I do have a, um, an indirect interest in a gold mine in Russia. So I just, you know, it's just an investment, but I, you know, I think uh, people should know, you always want to assess where people are coming from. So um, 
Yeah, I recommend a large allocation to cash, maybe as much as 30%. It's, it's a good deflation hedge. We're going to get inflation first, but when things get bad enough and you get into this recessionary scenario, that could flip to deflation. So cash does well in deflation. But the, the value of cash is that it gives you optionality. If I said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll sell you an out-the-money call on every asset class in the world, uh, is that valuable? You go, yeah, sounds pretty valuable. Well, that's what cash is. You can go out when everything's falling apart, you can be the one who goes out shopping, looks for bargains, and nobody's better at that than uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, gold, yeah, but I recommend 10%, not 50%, not all in, 10% slice of gold. In equities, I'd be looking at oil companies. Uh, they, uh, you know, they've been beaten down and run off the road because of these climate alarmist green new scammers, but uh, there's no way, and again, I own a solar field, so I know what I'm talking about. There's no way that solar and wind can are they growing yes do they have a role yes but energy demand is growing faster how do you close that gap you cannot close it unless you shut down the economy not a great idea but you cannot close that gap without oil um natural gas uranium and, and coal for that matter uh, you know clean burning coal so uh uh we probably do need a little more co2 in the environment seriously it's getting um it's getting thin uh, but uh, but the point being, those stocks have been so beaten down, they are indispensable. They're not going away. There is no substitute. So I would look at, uh, you know, whatever, Shell, Exxon Mobil, BP, any one of the major oil companies. Uh, gold mining, because it's a leverage bet on gold. Uh, real estate, for sure, not commercial real estate, but residential real estate. Um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of ways to play. Yeah, and I think um, just important to note, diversity is key. And, and by diversity, we're not talking about you know, 10 different S&P 500 ETFs yeah. we're talking yeah. about actual diversity in, in different, completely different sectors, not just in equities. Right. Um, Jim, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time, giving us a true world tour. Um, and I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you, Justine. Thank you. All right.